Please be seated. <clears throat> Scripture reading this morning comes from Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 4, a great passage of reconciliation. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins, they shall raise up the former devastations, they shall repair the ruined cities, the devastation of many generations. <clears throat> Good morning again. It's been such a blessing, <clears throat> been such a blessing to sing these songs of praise this morning to participate in the Lord's Supper together, to get to be the family of God together in one place today. It's wonderful that we get to do this every week, that we don't have to do this in secret or in fear, that we do this as we come together as the Lord's body freely. And that's something that we should never take for granted, something that we should be excited about every week. We do, again, want to welcome those who are here in person, those who are tuning in through our live stream this morning. We're so glad that you have chosen to be here with us today. I do want to thank everybody. I don't know if I, I thanked you or not, but I do want to thank everybody for the prayers that have been offered up on behalf of our brother Bob, who is uh, convalescing in the hospital right now. Uh, it's just been an amazing, in, in so many ways it's been a scary week. You know, I didn't know that Bob had passed out on Sunday. Um, Bob Neenstadt called me Monday and said, let's go visit Bob Graham in the hospital. And we went and saw him in the hospital, and he was up, and he looked fine, and he said, the ER doctor says he thinks I might have a brain tumor. And I said, how does an ER doctor know if you have a brain tumor or not? And before the end of the day, he was admitted over at Baylor Scott and White in Plano, and it was determined very quickly he did have that brain tumor. And it's an amazing world that we live in that you can have brain surgery on Friday, and be up and doing things the next day. It's, it's amazing. But all that pales in the power of the great physician God. I'm so thankful that uh, Bob is in God's hands. I'm so thankful for this congregation lifting up Bob in prayer and Atina in prayer and, and going before our advocate, Jesus Christ, to, to pray for them. It's a wonderful blessing that advocacy really is. I was I was thinking about this, this lesson this week, and I, I thought back about 36 years ago. I was three years old. It was this time of year. And my mother decided that at, on Christmas morning, I needed to wear a little pair of short pants and a long sleeve shirt and a big bow tie that I needed to look like a little Dutch boy on Christmas morning. I disagreed. <laughs> Guess who won? So there are pictures of me in this little Dutch boy outfit, and I hated this little Dutch boy outfit. I would tug at the tie, and I would try to pull it off, and my mom would stop me. And finally, at some point, she took me to my father and said, you need to take your son in the other room and deal with him. And I thought I was in big trouble. My dad took me to the other room. My dad got down on his knees. He reached around, and he took that bow tie off and undid that top button. He said, this is between me and you. You're not in trouble. That was the first case of advocacy that I can remember in my life. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about advocacy today. If you want to follow along <clears throat> in your paper Bibles today, we're going to be in verses 17 through 25 of the book of Philemon. 17 through 25. Philemon only has 25 verses in it. But really, if you wanted to have an overall theme of the book of Philemon, I believe that it could be advocacy. We see advocacy between Paul and Philemon on the case of Onesimus. We see advocacy as Paul talks about the great relationship that he had with the Colossian church. We see advocacy in Paul's request that he's going to make here. And so today, our goal is to see that we can break barriers down through advocacy. 
that by standing up for somebody else, that by putting our name out there, putting that name on the line, that we can help to break down the barriers that exist in people's lives with the greatest advocate at all as our, as our uh, companion, Jesus Christ. Join me as we look at Philemon 17 through 25 today. So, if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. Speaking of Onesimus. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. To say nothing of your owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers I will graciously be given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, Jesus sends you greetings to you. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Last week, we saw Paul begin this plea on behalf of the runaway slave Onesimus. We know that Onesimus had at one point been in the household of Philemon, that he, for whatever reason, chose to leave that place, that he ran away, that he came into contact with the Apostle Paul in Rome, that Paul studied with him, broke the bread of life unto him, and baptized him into Jesus Christ. We know that there were some dire consequences for runaway slaves at the time this was written. And Paul, on Onesimus's behalf, wrote to Philemon, asking him to forget what had happened, asking him to set aside the hurt that he had caused him and to welcome him back into his home. He wrote this, this letter in a in form of advocacy to help Onesimus to come back because he saw something in, in Onesimus that was good. He saw that Onesimus could be useful, like his name means, to Philemon and the church in Colossae. And today, we are here because of advocacy. We are here because somebody put their name on the line for us. We're here because somebody thought enough of us to vouch for us. And I believe that through advocacy, we can break down the barriers that exist in our world, in our fellowship, and that we can be a valuable tool for Jesus Christ in reaching the lost of this world. The word described here, translated here, is partnership. Paul considered Philemon to be a partner of his. He considered him to be a co-worker in the cause of Jesus Christ. He considered him to be a good person. But he also understood that Philemon had suffered a great loss when Onesimus ran away. There may have been some kind of monetary issue when he ran away. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. But Paul still recognized in Philemon a good partner. But he also had come to see Onesimus as a good partner as well. He began to see that Onesimus was useful for spreading the gospel, that he was useful in the kingdom. And he saw that these two men who already had a relationship could work together for the good of Jesus Christ. And so he served as a bridge, as an advocate for Onesimus. He asked Philemon to look upon the partnership that he had with Paul and to extend that partnership to Onesimus as he returns to him. He was being an advocate for this runaway slave named Onesimus. In our home recently, we've been watching reruns of the show Shark Tank. I don't know if you're familiar with the show or not, but on this show, you've got five or six sometimes venture capitalists. Uh, Dallas's own Mark Cuban is on the show, featured very prominently. But people come into the shark tank, into this room, and they have some kind of a business or some kind of a product that they're trying to get some funding for. They're going and asking for some money from these venture capitalists. They they make all kinds of pitches. They make all kinds of pleas for this money. And and if everything goes well, one or more of the sharks will offer to fund 
part of their business in return for some of that business. In essence, what happens is they enter into a partnership together. The people that go on a shark tank are hoping to use the credibility and the finance of these sharks to make their business successful. They are asking them to put their name literally <clears throat> on the line, on a contract that will help them in their business. And that's exactly what Paul demonstrates for us in this letter to Philemon. He is putting his name on the line. We're going to see as we progress through this passage today that he says, I write this in my own hand. There is a significance to that statement. The significance to that statement is this. Paul, we believe, had very poor eyesight. We believe that because he had been trained as a Pharisee, we believe that he had spent so much time uh, reading and studying at the feet of Gamaliel that he had ruined his eyesight. And so most of his letters were written by, uh, the fancy term is an amanuensis, but we would call them a scribe or a secretary. They would write Paul's letters. But oftentimes at the end of those letters, he would write a statement similar to what we see here in Philemon, that I write this in my own hand. He wrote it in his own hand to provide credibility. But what he was doing, literally, was putting his name on the line. He was writing his name. He was saying that he supported what was in this message. And in this case, he was writing to say that he supported the runaway slave Onesimus. That that slave is now useful, whereas once he was useless. And he put that name on the line. Brothers and sisters, we should be willing to put our name on the line for those who need it. We're going to meet people in our lives that are good people, but maybe they've made a mistake. We're going to meet people in our lives that don't know Jesus. And maybe they have some different ideas about how the world works. Maybe they have some different ideas about religion. And it's up to us to put our names out there, to put our names on the line, to advocate for those people, to bring them to Jesus Christ. It might be something as simple as asking a guest to sit down next to you on the pew where you sit. It might be something a little bit more complicated like asking them into your home for a meal or, or maybe even longer to live in your home. But whatever the case may be, there are going to be times in our lives when we, like Paul, will need to put our names on the line, where we will need to be an advocate for somebody else. And I pray that when those times come, we will look at Paul's example in this letter to Philemon, and that we will be willing to put our names on the line, the name of advocacy, to help bring someone closer to Jesus Christ. Growing up, our, our minister, his wife, her name is Joe Bryant. Joe had a business where she would go and she would fill vending machines and uh, doctor's offices and office buildings and things like that. It was just a little business to help them have a little bit more money. One time she was very, very busy and so she asked my brother's best friend if he would go and help her to fill vending machines. And so he did. He went with her and he helped her to fill vending machines. They worked a very long day. At the end of the day, she handed him some cash. And I love his response to this day. You're going to pay me? He was so excited that she, he didn't expect anything from her. And it's a beautiful part of this letter where Paul says, I write this in my own hand and I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me even your own self. You see, Paul is putting his name out there. He's putting his name on the line. He is willing to take care of some financial things. We're going to see that in just a moment. But Paul didn't really care about money. He didn't care about getting money back for Onesimus. He didn't care about any expenses he would be out. But he wanted him to understand that there was a greater debt that was owed here, and it was not a monetary debt, but that it was a spiritual debt. We know that Philemon came to Christ because of Paul. We know that the church in Colossae greatly benefited because Paul came and ministered to them. But the great lesson that Paul teaches us here is that we really shouldn't expect anything in return. We should expect that God is going to be God, that God is going to work through us, that God is going to do amazing things, but it's not about us. It's about what God can do. You see, being an advocate for somebody 
inherent in that venture is that you're probably not going to get a whole lot in return because of that. Think about the last time that someone came up to you and asked you for some change, and you gave them some change. You don't expect anything in return for that. Paul was not doing this because he wanted some grand gesture back from the Colossian church. He was doing this because it is the right thing to do. He was doing this because he saw something great in Onesimus that could be of benefit to the Colossian church. He is using what God has blessed him with, the gift of his words. He is using the relationship that he had built with Philemon to make sure that Onesimus had an advocate. And when we try to do the same kinds of things, when we try to live the same kind of life that Paul lives, demonstrated in the life of Philemon, we need to do so expecting nothing in return because it's not about us, it's about God. It's about what God can do through us. And if something good happens because of that, praise God. And we will live and we will revel in that and we will give God all the glory for that. But being an advocate and breaking down those barriers means that we should expect nothing in return because we are blessed to do the work that God has put, placed us here to do. I believe that it is in partnership that our hearts are refreshed. It's clear that Paul was friends with Philemon, that he was friends with many in the Colossian church, but he was more than just friends. He was partners with them. I look out into this group of people assembled here today, and I see many friends in this audience, and I'm thankful that we're friends. I'm thankful I don't perceive that we have any barriers between us. I feel like that we have good friendships here. But as I look out into this audience, I see more than friends. I see partners in the gospel. I see co-workers in the kingdom. And my heart is refreshed in that partnership. Several of us got to experience a, a study through the gospel of the, book of, of the book of John a few weeks ago. And my heart was refreshed in that. To be together, to study God's word together, to build one another up, it was a great experience. And I pray that our partnership, our refreshed hearts, are not only found in the study of God's Word, but in being the hands and feet of Jesus in this community. That we will have refreshed hearts because we are doing the work of the Lord together. That we will have refreshed hearts because we are putting our name out there as the Web Chapel Church of Christ in advocacy for those who do not yet know Jesus Christ. I believe that's what Paul is teaching us through this great letter. This is a beautiful peek into a, a very personal relationship that Paul had with Philemon. But I believe it teaches us a great deal about breaking down barriers through partnership and through advocacy. Trust has to be present in a community of believers like this. I trust you. As a minister, I trust you to support me and my family, and I'm thankful for that. As the church, as the Lord's body, we must have trust that we can hold one another accountable to the standard that is found in the Word of God. That's what Paul is doing with this letter to Philemon. He is holding him accountable to the will of God. And you have to have trust if that's going to happen. And there can't be barriers in trust. It is through advocacy, it is through putting our names out there, it is through that trust that we break down the barriers that exist in our lives. Paul goes really above and beyond in writing this letter. He is so confident in his writing. There is no doubt in his mind that the things that he is writing, the things that he asked Philemon to do, are going to be done. He says, confidence of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. Paul believed so much in God's working through Philemon that he believed that he was going to do even more than he could say. And, and I believe that this is a common theme in Paul's writings. I'm often asked, what is your favorite passage of Scripture? One of my, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, or maybe I should say my favorite passage of Scripture for today is Ephesians 3.20, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. That's what Paul is writing about here. He is writing about God working through someone 
in a bigger way than he has even asked or imagined. And he is confident that that will happen. He's confident that it will happen because of the man that Philemon was, but more than that, he is confident that that will happen because of who God is, because of the example that Jesus Christ lived out for us. And he is confident because Philemon is a good man. Philemon is a good man because he came to know Jesus Christ. And in our lives, we need to trust that God is always going to go above and beyond anything we can ask or that we can imagine. We need to have confidence in that as we try to be advocates for those who do not yet know Jesus Christ. We need to believe that God can work on their hearts. We need to believe that it may not be us that brings that person to Christ, but maybe we plant that seed and God hands them off to somebody else that can bring them to Jesus Christ. But we can't do that if barriers exist. That's why we need advocacy to break down those barriers. I love that Paul shows such confidence in so much so that he makes a request of Philemon. He says, would would you prepare a room for me, please? He wants to have a place to stay when he comes back to Colossae. Now, let's remember where Paul is when he's writing this. Do you remember? He's in Rome. More than that, he's in prison. He is under arrest. He has no freedom. He does not enjoy the amenities of the day because he is under arrest. And yet, as he writes this letter, he boldly and confidently writes, prepare a guest room for me. Why was he able to be so confident? He was able to be confident because he believed that God was bigger than his imprisonment. He was able to be confident because Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of God as our advocate and that he answers our prayers. He believed that he was going back to Colossae. He believed he was going to be in Philemon's household again. He believed that he was going to be there with Onesimus, and they were going to partner together in working in the kingdom. They were able to do that because the barrier that existed between Onesimus and Philemon was going to be broken down through the advocacy of Paul, but also more so through the advocacy of Jesus Christ. And we need to have that kind of faith in our lives as well, that when we, when we pray, that God will answer our prayers. And this is a congregation that I believe believes those things. We believe in the deliverance that comes through Jesus Christ. I want to say one more time how thankful I am to the Lord's Church that meets here at Webb Chapel that you prayed for our brother Bob Graham this week. The outpouring of love in prayer was amazing, but it's not unusual for this church. But I want to say something else this morning, too. Bob Graham is pretty easy to love because Bob loves everybody. Bob never met anybody he doesn't love, and so Bob's pretty easy to love. And so it's easy to pray for Bob, but the thing I love about the Webb Chapel Church of Christ is that you pray for the people that aren't always easy to love, too. I have a feeling that Onesimus wasn't always easy to love. We see that he ran away from Philemon. He may have stolen some money from Philemon. He definitely cost Philemon some productivity. He definitely cost Philemon some shame. So maybe he wasn't always that easy to love. And what Paul is asking Philemon to do on behalf of Onesimus is to love him even when he's not easy to love. Paul knows that this can happen because he believes in the deliverance through Jesus Christ. He believes he's going to be released from prison. He doesn't believe he's going to be released from prison because someone paid somebody off. He doesn't believe he's going to be released from prison for good behavior. He believes he's going to be released from prison because God's people are praying for him to be released from prison. He believed in a God that can do all that we can ask, more than we can ask and more than we can imagine. And he believes he's going to be released from prison because he has an advocate with that father. His name is Jesus Christ. And we need to have that same kind of belief in our prayers. Thank you again for praying for Bob, who's so easy to love. Let's make sure we're praying for those that aren't easy to love as well. Let's make sure that we believe that God hears those prayers just as much as he hears the ones for those who are easy to love. And let's be advocates in our prayers for those who are lost and for those who need to come to Jesus Christ. 
I would say that Paul had a very interesting life. He was trained as a Pharisee, that he lived in that upper crust of Jewish society. In fact, he would even say that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, that if anyone had a right to boast, it was him. But he gave all that up to become an itinerant, tent-making preacher. He didn't have family to speak of. He didn't, have a, he didn't own a home to our knowledge. He had a business, but he had a business to help fund his preaching. But I believe this. I believe that Paul made friends very easily. And I believe that once you were Paul's friend, that you were his friend for life. I believe that Paul was a faithful friend and a friend to all. And we see that in the book of Philemon. We see him writing a letter to a friend on behalf of a friend. That's the kind of life we need to live. We need to live that life of easily making friends, of keeping those friends close to us, of advocating for those friends when we need to advocate for them. But most importantly, what we can see in Paul's life is that he always told his friends about Jesus Christ. He always told them about the most important person in his life. And we need to do the exact same things. He, he mentions some names here. And if you're just reading this very short letter and you just, just blow right through that, you probably wouldn't think a whole lot about these names. But these names are very important in Paul's life. He begins by mentioning Epaphras. He was a fellow gospel preacher. He was the first one to speak the gospel in Colossae. He, was, he might have been in prison with Paul. He was someone that, that Paul thought very highly of. Mark, better known to us as John Mark, is the cousin of Barnabas, and he's someone who Paul actually had a barrier with at one point in his life. You see, there was a time Paul was getting ready to go on a missionary journey. It was suggested that he take John Mark with him, and he and Barnabas disagreed sharply, we read in Scripture. Paul didn't want to take, didn't want to take John Mark with him. They, they disagreed over these things. And yet, somewhere along the way, they became friends again. Somewhere along the way, the barrier came down between Paul and John Mark. Aristarchus was a brother who had been with Paul since the riot in Ephesus, and he was someone that Paul trusted implicitly. Demas, unfortunately, was someone who allowed a barrier to grow in his life. He loved the world more than he loved the church and the people who make up the church. And unfortunately, Demas falls away. But at least at some point in his life, Paul and Demas were friends. Luke is the first recorded Christian physician. And like Paul, he wrote a great deal of the New Testament. We also read in Paul's writings that towards the end of his life, that it was Luke who was with him. They were long-term friends. Paul thought very highly of all of these men, these men, enough to mention them in this great letter, but they were more than just names in a letter. They were more than just friends. They were his fellow workers. And again, as I look out into this audience this morning, I see my friends, but I see my fellow workers. I see those that may be better at something than I am. I see those who maybe excel at something I struggle at. I see a great workforce for Jesus Christ out here in this audience today. And I hope that you see yourselves that way as well. I hope you don't just see yourselves as members of a country club. I hope you don't just see yourselves as checking something off a list this week. I hope you see yourselves as fellow workers in the kingdom of Jesus Christ, ready to advocate for those who do not yet know Jesus Christ, to put your name on the line, to study with them, to invite them into your home, to love those people and to bring them to Christ. And Jesus is the ultimate advocate. Paul does a great job. Paul writes this letter masterfully. I believe that when these letters were delivered to Philemon, that he was supposed to read Philemon first. And I believe that after reading that letter, that he accepted Onesimus back into his home, that the barriers were broken down. Paul is a master letter writer. He's a master ad advocate, but he has nothing on Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ 
left the splendor of heaven. He came and lived on this earth. He was crucified on a cross. He was laid in a tomb, a borrowed tomb. He rose again after three days, and he now sits at the right hand of God. Jesus' purpose for coming to this earth was to be our advocate. He lived a life as a human being so he could learn what it was like to be a human being so that he could be an advocate for us. In our study, we just completed the book of Hebrews, we know that he is an advocate, that he is the mediator of the new covenant. We know that he sits at the right hand of God and that when we come before God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit in prayer, that Jesus' role is to intercede on our behalves to talk to God on our behalves, to put his name on the line on our behalves. In fact, we saw that on the cross, didn't we? He put his name on the line. We know that on the cross, above him, it said, Hail, King of the Jews. That's one name that Jesus is known by. He put his name on the line for us. Paul would write that, God made him who knew no sin to become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. What Paul was saying was Jesus put his name on the line for us, that Jesus is our advocate, and that we should live a life in service to God because we have an advocate with God named Jesus Christ. Today, if you are not a Christian, if you have not put on Christ in baptism, I'm going to tell you, what the barrier in your life is. The barrier in your life is called sin. There's absolutely nothing you can do about that sin on your own. You can do good things, you can donate money, you can go and you can, you can preach, you can do all those things, but if you don't have Jesus in your life, if you have not been washed of your sins in the blood of Jesus Christ, you are always going to have a barrier between you and God. Isaiah tells us our sins have separated us from God. They are a barrier between us and God. But because of the advocacy of Jesus Christ, because of his life on earth, for his death, his burial, and his resurrection, you can have that barrier broken down in your life. When you are baptized in that watery grave of baptism, when you come up, your sins are washed away. You have been added to the family of God. The barrier of sin is done away with. And you have a new family. If you have not experienced that, if you have not put on Christ in baptism, please don't wait any longer. Today you may be here and you may be struggling with something as a Christian. You might be like Demas. You might be allowing your love for the world to come between you and God and God's family. I would encourage you this morning, if that is the case, if that's where you are, please allow us to come and surround you in love and pray for you and to advocate it through our prayers to God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you're joining us through our online uh, live stream today, use one of the points of contact on screen. We want to help you too. We want to know you to know that you have a church family here. If you are here in person, let what you, what's going on in your life be known. Let us advocate for you. Let Christ advocate for you as we stand, as we sing. Yeah.